I'm Joe Cicala. I'm the founder and CEO of Dream Exchange. Dwayne Kyles, my partner, majority owner of DX Capital Partners, and the majority control of the Dream Exchange is with us today. And I'm sure there's a lot of new people. So if you've been here before and some of the things you're going to hear, you've heard before, there's going to be some more, I think, really impressive updates in the next couple of months because we've been hard at work building a stock exchange. And so this is a, maybe a little bit of review, but we wanted to get back into the webinar series because many people like what we have to say. I usually start with a video presentation, especially for the new people to sort of give you the overview in a concise way of, of what the Dream Exchange is, and I'm really proud of our marketing team for creating this. So before I let Dwayne introduce himself, I'm gonna play our purposes video, and then we'll jump right in and hopefully not, not have everybody more than about one hour. The truth is that you know, 120 years ago, you couldn't travel to the store without a horse and a buggy. Uh, you couldn't travel interstate without getting on a train. And since that time, well, clearly no one would consider taking their horse to the grocery store. You get in a climate controlled vehicle. We live in a technological society where we have wireless communication that never existed before. We've changed the way human beings live on earth in such a profound way. And the reason that innovation came to be is because Capital markets supported the most imaginative ideas. We gave our money to things that would expand our ability to survive by supporting others who had brilliant ideas and great imaginations. We've all been better off for it. And it is across all diverse marketplaces, across all people everywhere. And we're concentrating on developing markets in areas where greatest ideas are in fact and we want to get them access to the money they need to expand it. That's really what the Dream Exchange is all about at its core purpose. Folks, for those of you who have not uh, seen me before, I'm Dwayne Kyles. I am the managing member of DX Capital Partners. As Joe said, we bought the controlling interest in the Dream Exchange, making it the nation's first Black-owned stock exchange. Joe and I have been working together for about 20 years now. I know him well. I know his heart. Not only will this be the first time that we have had a black owned stock exchange, but it will be the first time I think ever that the principles of a stock exchange were totally committed to making sure that access to capital is democratized. We're going to make sure that if you have a small business that is promoting something that is going to be good for your customers, good for the country, good for the world, that we're going to do all we can to make sure you get the capital you need to realize your dreams and the dreams that we have for our nation and for the world. America is in a position to kind of regain its position in the world as the largest, fastest growing economy. We're slipping. China's nipping at the heels. And there's no reason for it because we have the ingenuity, we have the resources, we have the desire, we have the people to maintain the world, the top slot in the world for, the, for innovation, for an expanded economy. Um, but it's going to take some changes in how we view capitalism, how we think about it, you know, how we look at the rewards of capitalism. And the Dream Exchange is going to do a lot to help move us and the economy in the direction of making sure that people 
who really work hard, people who bring integrity to the workplace every day, people who bring enthusiasm and an open mind. Those people are going to be prioritized in our work. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we build an infrastructure to support people getting into an ecosystem that provides that kind of encouragement, that kind of mentoring, that kind of access to capital. Uh, we don't think there's anything quite like this. I think it happens in pockets and, small, and you know, it happens here, it happens there. But if you're not connected to someone and you don't know somebody or, or related to someone or get the hookup, then odds are, you know, you're struggling. And trust me, Joe and I have bonded over the last 20 years dealing with exactly those folks who are out here with great ideas, great enthusiasm for what they're doing, the right energy, the integrity, all they need to really have these companies take off is capital, access to capital. And that has been the missing piece for so long, for so many. We're turning dreams into capital. I mean, that's what we're going to do. And I'm so excited and I feel so fortunate to have met Joe, form this relationship and really be part of a team of people who share that dedication. We are so lucky that we've been able to find people in the finance industry. And I would have thought maybe a few years ago that this might not be so possible, but we have found people in the finance industry who share our enthusiasm, share our passion, and really, really are looking to change the world in that we are going to really bring humanity. We're going to bring integrity. We really want to bring these things at an unprecedented level. I'm not going to say they don't exist because they clearly do, but we think that they have been beaten into the ground to some extent by the greed and the, you know, and the short sightedness and of just people who have been clawing to get more and more and more and more. And that just isn't the way it has to be. It doesn't have to be that way. And it never has been, Dwayne. You know, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I'm really glad you brought that up as a, as a part of the introduction because there's so many false ideas about finance right. and so many things that we need to disabuse people about. And I've been in capital markets and finance for 30 years. And, you know, expressions like greed is good or <laughs> dog eat dog or, right. uh, you know, zero sum game with the best investors. And there are some very wealthy people that were been my clients who showed me over the course of my career that that doesn't work. And, and just back at Dwayne, it's just an honor to have. Dwayne, who has worked so diligently his whole career in every way in the capital markets and out of the capital markets toward improving parity and equity and, and equality in the country in in the in the lane of Dr. King um, and you know, Dwayne and his whole family, his father. I've been referring to it this way. I think I'm more than substantially correct in saying that. Dwayne and his family, they're civil rights icons. And the integrity of what we're doing supersedes everything. It's why my friendship with him over the last 20 years has been so easy. And kind of view each other as partners to the extent that, you know, there's minority control, but we're really building a state of the art system. And we're really on the bleeding edge of creating equality in capital markets. And, you know, perhaps this is a bit of a longer purpose driven introduction than we usually give. But I think that the importance of what we're doing for the society is to cultivate the imagination of the American small business and entrepreneurial market. I heard someone recently say, you know, the United States defeated the Soviet Union in the Cold War by selling Coca-Cola and delivering rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's true. The American spirit has always been at the forefront of the innovations that have made the world a great place to live. And 
what we haven't done, and we really haven't done this well, is make an inclusive environment in capital markets for every idea from every corner of our society. And that really, this is a historical company at a historical time in our country's evolution. And it's an idea whose time has come. And I'm, I'm just honored to be with the group of people that we have. You know, without further ado, what we are saying about our historical nature can't be understated. We have a 230 year history of stock exchanges in the United States. And the fact is that in 230 years, we've never had something dedicated to a parity and equality in the capital market system. The fact is that that as a pioneering event is something that transcends anything that's ever been done before. Today, we're, we're first gonna give you a little bit of data on what diversity in capital markets is all about. And then we're gonna go through what the decline, the actual data on the decline of small IPOs means. I don't. I never know what the audience is. We get big audiences. There may be people that don't know that IPO means initial public offering. It's the first time a company sells its stock to the general American investing in public. And, and then we're gonna talk about what the harmful effects of that have been and finally go through our solution. So we took a little more time on giving you purpose, but the meat and potatoes is, is definitely coming. So I, I thank you for being here late on a, on a Tuesday and we'll, we'll get on with our show. So I started my career as a cavalry officer in the United States Army, but I've been a civil rights lawyer and a securities lawyer for the past 30 years uh, and a CPA. You know, as part of that experience, kind of all roads have come together in this environment where I'm uniquely positioned, I guess, because my first thing I claim to fame, I guess, is I was the lawyer who founded or represented the founders of Archipelago. Archipelago was the first company to actually trade securities over the internet in 1996. And it would be merged with the New York Stock Exchange later. And what you know as NYS Arca today, which is the New York Stock Exchange, is the one in the same company that we worked on to invent really what is the national market electronic system. And Dwayne, I'm gonna highlight you here. Dwayne too, he's an attorney, Georgetown Law graduate, really worked well in the city and, and was special counsel to Mayor Harold Washington on minority business development. So in addition to knowing the capital market system of the whole country, we really do and have worked together on a lot of very small companies in business development, especially in the minority markets. So we understand the landscape of the environment. That, that being said, the two leaders of the organization now, we've expanded since our last webinar. We've got a chief technology officer, an exchange architect, chief information securities officer. They're all pedigreed people in the technology area, prior NASDAQ senior architects and CTOs, you know, security for the Federal Reserve. <laughs> so our team at the top that we've assembled right now is at the top of the industry. And it's not just Dwayne and I. So we're, we're up to about 17 employees. We expect to be about 40 when we open next year. We expect to be filing our form one soon. When I say soon, I'm hoping within the next quarter, you know, we'll have a fully functional exchange in that period of time. And then we'll go through the process with the SEC. So it's Duane and I, but we've built a much larger team, which is not on this slide. And perhaps in a future webinar, I'll actually bring on some of our team to talk to their specific areas. That having been said, you know, why are we looking at addressing the public capital markets in the diversity area? And, and this slide is actually a very compelling <laughs> visual which shows you how many minority owned companies are actually participating in the United States public capital markets, which is extremely small. And uh, the, the fact is that out of the 6,000, there's actually almost 6,300 public companies, only eight are black owned companies. 
historically black owned companies just don't participate in public capital markets. Going public, even getting private capital is a very relationship driven environment. And, you know, if you know someone at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, perhaps you'll have an easier time raising your private capital or even going public. But if we open this marketplace in a way that allows access for the ideas and the companies, and that's really where the growth of value is, great ideas become great public companies. And we need to open access to that across the board, minority and minority, non-minority alike. So we want to help all early stage companies. But in particular, there are some amazing companies that are already approaching our exchange that are minority owned, that are extremely solid, that if with a little capital would become very large public companies. And why is that important? So the importance of what I just said is in, this is our research, normalizing what an, an initial public offering is for the, we have this data going back 50 years. And to normalize it, we realize that a benchmark, the important benchmark is a company seeking $50 million in the public capital markets. And you'll see that before 2000, the overwhelming majority of new public companies were $50 million and under. That's the powder blue bar in this graph. Well, when you see that in most years, we had several hundred, some years we had as many as seven or 800. And then if you look at the, the current 20 years, the, there aren't as many in the last 20 years as there were in any one year before the year 2000. That's a lot of extremely valuable companies that have not availed themselves of the public markets meaning that the general American investing public is able to build wealth by getting in early on the IPO. And the, the fact is that without that ability, without the ability to access public capital markets, many, many, many things are missing from that marketplace. Now, this one, especially as we talk to congressional leadership, shows an overlay in that red line of the importance of job growth. So 92% of all jobs in a company are created after the company goes public. So if you think about that, a, a company that's a good small company with 100 employees expands to 1,000 employees if it's able to make public capital markets. Now, and that's not our data. That's the United States Treasury and the SEC ran a task force on this phenomenon, they were worried, they continue to be worried that we're not adding public companies to our marketplace. Only the very largest unicorn companies, multi-billion dollar IPOs are reaching the public markets. And because of that, we have job growth in the small public mar marketplace really at an all time low. So when you, it doesn't take a mathematician to take the statistics I just gave you about minority participation, very, very few, if any, minority companies ever reach the public capital markets. And job growth occurs in a company after it reaches the public capital markets. So there isn't meaningful living wage career path jobs in the public company sector in the minority community. We've been briefing Congress these last couple of months and, I, and I've consistently said, you know, if you look at the headquarters of a large public company, Allstate Insurance is right here. It's three miles from, from my office. They have 30,000 employees at their world headquarters. That's 30,000 jobs at their world headquarters. Is it any wonder that the surrounding community is flourishing? Well, we intend to reach directly into these very good companies that are literally physically located in the urban areas in minority communities and see them reach the public market markets and expand participation in all facets of society, a ripple effect of job creation will occur when we're reaching that marketplace. In fact, you know, it's not merely easy minimum wage jobs. We're talking about 
career path jobs in human resources and marketing and treasury and quality control and public relations. Every public company needs the entire menu of those types of jobs. And when there's a lagging indicator of, of growth in, in employment, or you see in this graph, it's unemployment that goes down after large numbers of small cap IPOs occur. So when we restore this marketplace, it actually has a tremendously stabilizing effect on the entire economy so that it, you're not beholden to a, one very large corporation that might lay off a lot of people when you have a diverse marketplace, not only a racially diverse one, but also a diverse set of small companies that are able to sustain themselves in the public markets. So the fact is that this data is the driving force behind legislation that's moving its way through Congress quite well. We have our fingers crossed because we've had very successful meetings, and I'll get to that in a moment. The, the point is that the substance of what we're doing is scholarly research that's published. The research behind the Dream Exchange is actually published in Oxford University's Handbook on IPOs. It's chapter nine. There's actually three parts to the chapter. I'm the author of one of those parts with our director of research. So we actually did scholarly research to support the exact functionality of this new exchange. So with, with that publication and actually international acceptance of the viability of a new type of stock exchange, we were then able to easily persuade the Securities Exchange Commission and many members of Congress towards the idea of creating a brand new type we didn't just presume, oh, those small cap companies went away, that's bad. We actually researched in the publication I just told you to determine what were the harmful effects on capital markets. So first of all, small companies experience a tremendous burden right now. If they want capital, they really have to work hard at creating it privately which puts enormous pressure on the senior management of the company. They have to know people, they have to have relationships to, to get venture capital or private equity money before they have a lineup for a, a transaction. And really only the very largest companies can avail themselves of the public markets. And it just delays the process so long that it becomes difficult for that company to survive. In addition, when they make public capital markets, all their relationships change. Their insurance relationships, their banking relationships. Now that it's a, they're in a public setting, the value of the company is more easily determinable. So they can expand not only through the capital that comes through an IPO, but with all the other programs, all the different forms of, of what we call alternative methods of financing in banks, are more available to a small public company than they are to a private company. And this is perhaps one of the more important harmful effects. Investors, and I've been doing this close to 30 years, the one primary question that a private investor always asks before they invest is how will I recuperate my investment profitably? They, they never invest a dollar to get back 99 cents. And if you can't explain how they're going to receive a dollar ten, generally they're very reluctant, and they it causes a tremendous downward pressure on the willingness to even invest in the private company to begin with. And in the past, the answer to how you'll get your money back was, well, when we reach these milestones, we'll go public. The, the ability to trade your stock in that company currently for small companies just doesn't exist. And so investors are, are marginalized and they're unwilling to make some of the small investments in the smaller companies because they just don't know. The company will either have to find a private equity firm to buy it, find a big company to buy it, or they have to immediately become highly profitable to pay dividends. 
And this is really underneath the research. The most valuable companies today often take longer to become profitable. Tesla Motors didn't make a profit until last summer. It's the most valuable retail electronic vehicle company in the world. So how did they do that? They had a better idea. The idea of being able to sell in a retail market electronic vehicle to a consumer priced at a range that many consumers can afford had never been accomplished before. So it was the idea that made the company the most one of the most valuable public companies in the world, yet they weren't paying dividends. Well, it's the exact same phenomena with an entrepreneur. People who have the best ideas take some time to perfect their market to make sure that they can become the larger company and become profitable. And the patience for that in the public markets is far greater than in the private markets. And the reason for it is, if the value of the stock continues to go up and the investor wants to transition and sell, he has the opportunity with secondary liquidity to sell his stock. So wealth creation for investors in these markets isn't occurring. And the wealth creation is you and I. We're not on the boards of the largest institutional investors. Uh, at least, I, uh, it, perhaps somebody is. I hope you are on, if you're on the call. But generally, the people we meet are common U.S. citizens with brilliant ideas, hardworking, ingenious business people who need the public capital markets to get the investors comfortable with being able to get liquidity and return the investment profit profitably. So that being said, these harmful effects, which have not gone on for 20 years, spawned us into what, what solutions we can come up with. So the first that we had to do was look at the overall capital markets structure. So, you know, we are providing a single solution to the ecosystem. And what you see in this graph is education, and I'm going to ask Dwayne to talk about what we're doing in that environment. But this, the venture exchange model, that's the title of the stock exchanges that currently don't exist. There is no such thing as a venture exchange legally today. It's in the Main Street Growth Act about to be born. But that is an important stepping stone in the ecosystem so that the emerging public company can actually reach the national market system and not only the multi-billion dollar unicorn company, but the very good and solid. In, in the range that we're looking at, most of the companies, and we've, we've modeled a couple of companies for the exchange. Um, over the five-year span of time, those companies, they did between a 12 and a 17% rate of return, able to reach in a, in a ecosystem marketplace the national exchanges. So those companies have actually graduated to the NASDAQ stock exchange in our research. So that's a very good return. After they reach the national market system, now they're competing with the other larger companies. 12 to 17% isn't bad in any marketplace for a public company. So what's important about the stepping stone of filling the void on the on-ramp that you see in this visual is that the venture exchange marketplace, public marketplace, for small companies doesn't exist, and we're creating that very marketplace. Preceding that, and I think Duane can talk to this a little bit, one of the things we have to pay careful attention to is the financial literacy in small businesses. So we're, we've begun the process of creating educational programs. We're actually in the process of forming a foundation as well to just bring education to the marketplace. I don't know, Duane, if you want to address some of the ideas that you have on where we're headed long term for helping get financial literacy into the into the marketplace perhaps that'll sure. help clear it up unlike most exchanges we are absolutely aware of and committed to making sure that the absence of financial literacy in the community is addressed in a systemic way that is sustainable forever whether we're talking about the aerial academy in chicago that for 25 years has been teaching children as young as kindergarten 
financial literacy and how to invest, why can't we help take that model and expand it nationwide? So you're talking about grammar school. I, we really have talked about Saturday school for older kids where experiential learning is used to solve problems, critical thinking skills in the community around money. But we're talking about wellness. We're talking about culture. We're talking about other things that really help to make better citizens and better neighborhoods. So we get them in this ecosystem that is committed to providing access to educational materials. With the internet, we can put this stuff online. We can make sure that we're not trying to create our own avenues for distribution of this information, but that we are developing community partners, organizations like the National Urban League, Chicago Urban League, whether there are organizations like the YMCA, the YWCA, the Boys and Girls Club. These institutions have been around for a long time, but for the most part, none of them have really focused on financial literacy or financial markets or that kind of education. So what we want to do, rather than trying to attack all this ourselves, is to create partnerships and make sure that we provide access to the information that, again, would be developed by teams of people from across the country, some of the best minds we can get hold of, to create these ideas about how best to get push this information out and make it available to anybody that's really interested, make it affordable, make it the best in class information, and if we can do that, we can give people a solid foundation, starting with kindergarten, going up through secondary school into small business MBAs. We would like to link MBA students with owners who are thinking about aging out or who, who have no succession plan. Why not link those MBA students with those companies so that they can get practical experience, the benefit of those founders experience, and then help them find ways to take those companies and to continue to build them. So much of the disinvestment in our community has come from that inability to link those resources so that we could keep those businesses in the community. And so, we're, we're in the, you know, like there's a practical matter. We're already doing this. We're already in the early stage discussions the right. largest financial institutions in the world are in early stage discussions with us about participating in this ecosystem. Right. And in fact, one we can name is that we've made a partnership with the University of Wisconsin and the Lubar College of Business. The Lubar College is very forward thinking. I was named to their advisory board uh, about a month and a half ago. And as part of that process, they have a direct community outreach to bring in uh, students of color, but they also have dedicated programs in their undergraduate to teach finance of capital markets so that there'll be job creation at the university level where maybe we're working our way backwards to the elementary level, but we've already begun a partnership with a major top 25 United States university to do exactly what Dwayne was just suggesting, is get capital market experience into the university setting, because the only other way students get that experience is they get a job at Goldman Sachs or Morgan, right. JP Morgan. And without that experience and that job opportunity, very few people can actually make it into the public company setting in finance. So we're actually creating curriculum at the university level that will give undergraduates the opportunity. We've actually hired one of the undergraduates already. They'll get a certificate in capital finance directly related to the public capital markets that generally is only taught in a sort of a collateral way in, in undergraduate programs, but now they're dedicating themselves to doing that. And as we move it back into aerial capital programs that they have in, in the institutions, you know, the, the community development, those students will then be seeing from a very early age how they can move through an educational system and then expand their, their collegiate education to see hope and to see a pathway to long-term career, you know, job opportunities. 
So we're already doing a, a good part of this educational process. You know, as a jumpstart, we don't need a stock exchange license to show our true colors in what we're going to be doing once we're opened. And it's just very profound for us to actually see the reception amongst the largest financial institutions in the world, seeing that this is part of the problem and they want to be part of the solution alongside of our organization. So we, I think we have some more announcements other than University of Wisconsin coming very, very soon. So the, the other part of this, when, when we're going into Q&A, a big part of what we're doing pertains to uh, the Main Street Growth Act. We didn't add the slides here, but the Main Street Growth Act, and I'm, I'm going to, this is a call to arms, <laughs> um, <laughs> because right now we're at critical mass. This is our year. The Main Street Growth Act had its hearing in the House Financial Services Committee about two months ago. I'm one of, the, I don't like to say this this way because it sometimes offends congressional leadership, but it's about an 11 page securities law that allows for the creation of venture exchanges. And in 2018, it actually unanimously passed the House Financial Services Committee, the floor of the House of Representatives and the Senate. And the only reason we're talking about it as a bill today is because if you recall at the end of 2018, the government was shut down. And when the, the new Congress, they, they changed from the 115th to the 116th Congress. Well, all legislation introduced in the prior Congress was basically put on the start line again, even though this is a bill who, in a bipartisan way, had unanimous support of both, both houses of Congress. And then we've had a couple of years of COVID and a little bit of the political unrest that goes on. It's only an 11-page securities law. But it's captured the attention of very significant congressional leadership at this time because it's a job creation law and it requires the government to spend zero dollars. Right. So it's an economic stimulus for our stock exchange. They'll be competitors. We're, we have our particular brand. We're the first minority exchange. We have a pension for innovative new ideas, whether they're in manufacturing, technology, biopharma, retail and, and consumer goods, agricultural, we've got, we've got companies on the list trying to, to reach us. So the fact is that this job creation without the government having to appropriate money by using the capital markets is an idea whose time has come. And it, I, I wish you could actually observe the receptions we get among congressional leaders from both parties. To get a piece of legislation to have unanimous consent in the United States Congress, to get two parties in this environment to mm -hmm. agree that water is wet <laughs> is, is a <laughs> vertical task. But across the board, every single person we speak to never is got a challenge to the efficacy and to the, the rightness of what we're doing. And I don't know where all of you live, but if you have a minute, there's going to be some offers at the end of the slides here. I, I would say that clicking on the link and finding out, and we'll help you find out who your congressman is. And we, I, I'm asking, I'm making an appeal that Letters to the congressional leadership from grassroots constituents rather than from a corporation that's trying to have meetings with, with congressional leadership is very valuable. We've actually gone to meetings in the past and had U.S. senators and congressmen telling us, you know, my constituent wrote me a letter. So the fact is that your support is of vital importance because if you tell your congressman, this is a good thing for America. It's a good thing for our country. And knowing now that the Dream Exchange has, as part of its business plan, the development of a venture exchange, that would be very helpful to us. So a lot of people ask, how, many, how can I help? That's one way in particular. The other thing I want to mention is this, following us. I'm going to let Dwayne have some closing comments too, but right now, we are an opinion leader in capital markets. We're building a state-of-the-art national exchange. 
whether the venture exchanges develop this year or next year, we will be opening with a certainty within a year the nation's first national market exchange, stock exchange, that will be majority owned by the black community. That's what we're doing. And that is something that can't we can't understate the importance, the historical importance of that. The day we ring the first bell, where we have a dedicated purpose to seeing the expansion of equality in public capital markets will really be a first in our country's history. And as we move through our business plan and as we move through the milestones of our future, it's vitally important that the public support we get is is very high. There are actually other licensed stock exchanges, I noticed this the other day, that only have about 500 more LinkedIn followers than we do. <laughs> so there's a very large uh, swell of support and we want to continue to educate the community. I had a conversation the other day where I was talking to a business owner and he didn't even know what an incubator was. He didn't know the resources were available to him to learn about incubators and learn to raise money there. And actually the leaders of incubators, many incubators have already spoken to us about their companies in their incubator using the dream exchange as the platform by which the companies in their incubator exit to the public markets. So the fact is that it's not just the business community, the venture capital community, the congressional leadership, but the, the, the common American person who is willing to follow us and show their support. It's actually how we get paid. There's a lot of times that we've delivered webinars and I've said this and I really mean it. People are for us. This has been a labor of love uh, for, for Duane and I, you know, for the past 15 years to get to this point and just being acknowledged sometimes that, you know, we're in the vacuum of building the fixed protocols for the connections for the exchange. And we're in the, we're in the guts of the day-to-day, -day, very complex rules to create an electronic stock exchange and then the build the venture exchange. So we're not exactly having our pulse on the, on the cheerleading that happens for us until we do something like this. So I really am grateful when that happens. And it's even more important to us when you take an important step to support us publicly by writing a message to your congressman or even clicking on the link to make sure you keep following us and attend webinars and the more of an audience we get for these we've had as many as eight thousand participants in some of our webinars i think sometimes we're two to three hundred sometimes but the fact is that the more support we get the more connections that we're able to make with entrepreneurs with people who are important supporters in both political leadership as well as the large capital market communities and, and we've we've made connections with the largest financial institutions some of which have come through just delivering a webinar so i know duane you may have, want to have some closing remarks and then i'll start looking at all the the chat room questions with my team because sometimes there's repeat questions let me do that while i let you close a little bit well first of all let me just say thank you for the gift of your time and your interest and what it is we're trying to do here. As you can probably tell, we have great passion for this work and we're absolutely committed to it. We have been very gratified by the kinds of receptions that we've received all over the place. People are constantly reaching out and trying to find out how it is that they can plug into what it is that we're doing because they appreciate how unique it is. So we thank you. And we hope that you'll continue, like you, like uh, Joe asked, for to follow us and to make sure that your voice is heard by your congresspersons, by other elected officials who you think might be either helpful or supportive of what we're trying to do. This is no time to be shy. Just uh, feel free to reach out and make sure that we are hearing your voice and making sure that we are getting the benefit of of the best advice out there from people who really care about what it is we're trying to do. Great. So I'm going to, uh, I've got there, actually, there's actually a lot of questions, but the team kind of takes them and puts them into a grouping so I can answer all of them. So one of the questions was, what are your connections with HCBUs to find out, uh, to find leaders and entrepreneurs? 
So we do have actually on our team, we have <laughs> people who have attended HBCUs, uh, but actually I think TELUS ended up graduating from North Carolina, but we're reaching out. There's actually a, what we found is a great fraternal connectivity at the HBCUs. A large number of those fraternities that we haven't done the more formal outreach we are about to embark upon uh, that as well, because one of the things that's going to become increasingly more important to us is our own program of adding staff. And we're going to be specifically looking at those universities for that particular reason. We also want to, we're piloting what we're doing at the University of Wisconsin, which means that once we've more formalized that program, then we want to be able to see how we can export that to the other colleges. So once we have a better idea, then it'll be easier to say, here's what we're doing, add water and mix. Someone asked, has there been an app developed for Dream Exchange? So right now we don't have an app. We do have a web developed social media meeting place called DreamX Connect. We have probably more than 2000 identities in there. We're going to be developing more of that because right now actually my what, what keeps me up at night is the, the drinking from a fire hose of the number of reaches and interest we have. So we're going to be really well organized to handle the flow of early stage companies that are reaching for the exchange. So there is an app in development, but the sequence right now is we're getting very, very close to having the full electronic construction of the national exchange completed. That's a milestone that will allow us to be stress tested by the SEC. I'm very proud of the team that's been there. I can't exactly tell you uh, how far along we are, but we're very, very, very far along. And that's extremely good news because from that will come the apps, from that will come the relationships with the larger institutions that will marry us up with the apps that will channel the people into, are you an entrepreneur? Are you an investor? Where should we send you once you arrive at the doorstep of the Dream Exchange? And the groups of our organization that will be handling those communications are in development. So yes, there's an app in development. It's not quite there. Hang on, let me see the next question. I'm getting more now. So uh, what happens if uh, we have to go into the next Congress? So this is an interesting phenomenon. Right now, this piece of legislation has historically been considered a Republican measure. We're the ones who've kind of made it bipartisan. That won't change in the next Congress. Some of the political air cover for what we're doing will actually get easier if there's a Republican leadership in the Congress. On the other hand, we don't have opposition in the Democrat leadership. So it, it doesn't really change very much Really what the, the main barrier or, or milestone we have to make is increasing the level of interest among congressional leadership at this time to take a, a very small piece of legislation and put it to the front of the row. We believe we've gotten that accomplished up to this point very, very well. The Main Street Growth Act is now in the Jobs Act 4.0 legislation in the Senate. It's had a hearing in the House, which is not concentrated on exchange bills. Uh, in fact, there have been very few hearings at all. <laughs> Duane is laughing at, at the heavy lifting we've done. In fact, I would say that there are fewer than five pieces of legislation that have a bill number in the exchange marketplace that have even had a hearing in the House Financial Services Committee to be considered for passing this year. So we're in a very, very small elite group of pieces of legislation that's poised now for the fall. And we'll see what happens. The government shut down <laughs> two years ago. So I'm not counting anything until it's done and we're not resting until it's it's completed. But a, a conservative versus liberal uh, versus progressive versus varying political viewpoints. I mean, the lead Democrat sponsor on the legislation is uh, Congressman Panetta from California. He's considered to be a strong member of the Progressive Caucus. So the person sponsoring our bill in the Democrats is a, 
progressive. The other sponsor in the, in the Republican side is Congressman Tom Ever. He's actually considered a conservative. So we're actually bringing people who ordinarily don't work together on political issues uh, together and co-sponsoring legislation. So we're not really worried about what might happen next year because, first of all, we're not we're approaching it like it's Normandy. They dropped the Dream Exchange off on the beach. The ships have sailed and there's only one direction we're going. We're not going back this year. We're going through or forward. I'm not concerned at all about what might happen next year. What is exit plan and ROI? So for Dream Exchange itself, if you're talking about us, we had a capital raise that went on for about 18 months. The investor pool is now complete. There are no new investors being uh, invited. There may be some investors we're going to be announcing through GX Capital who are minority celebrities, <laughs> if you will. Hopefully in the next 60 to 90 days, we'll have some announcements about that. The pool of, of private placement investors has been closed now for the last eight or nine months. Our plan as an exchange is to develop, make our milestones and eventually become a public exchange on our own exchange <laughs> uh, three, four years from now. The first step in the sequence is the, the national exchange license, which I think we're going to be very close to launching that uh, within the next few months. There's never been a stock exchange bankruptcy in the history of the country. They do. Stock exchanges are very good investments. They do very, very well. The, even the largest exchanges, NASDAQ, or the group of exchanges owned by the Intercontinental Exchange Group, they're, they're all extremely profitable. That goes without saying that, that we can do that, and we are. But really what we're concentrating on is the job of a stock exchange in capital formation. That's really not what people think of when they think of stock exchanges anymore. They, they think of trading, which is all happening in a secondary way. We're concentrating on capital formation. We think that that actually makes us more valuable as a company because the only exchange that's really cultivating new listings today is the NASDAQ. And as we develop this lower middle market and small cap marketplace, we will be cultivating a marketplace where there are thousands of potential company participants to grow our venture exchange. He's asking how many companies are committed to joining the exchange. So right now, because we're not a licensed exchange, we're not signing listing agreements. On the other hand, I can tell you that just as by way of one example, one of the incubators that we've talked to, they have 500 small companies in their incubator. They've raised $2 billion for those companies. They want to become, the, the exclusive bank, investment bank for them, wants to be able to use the better quality companies to, to come right to the exchange. So there will be thousands of companies. What's incumbent upon us, and like I said before, the sleepless night, how do we make sure that we service and validate every single market participant who comes to see us and make sure that we don't lose a single valuable ingenious idea? That's the goal. We don't want to lose those valuable ideas in the shuffle. So that part of the exchange is, is in development as well, albeit that it's second to getting the national market exchange license, getting open. I would say there are hundreds of companies kind of waiting in the wings with their powder dry to get moving with us. So, you know, 1871 down in Chicago, and they actually have a women's business development center. I'm actually aware of that. They're exactly right that you're picking up the concept here. That would be a great feeder organization. Those organizations, once they've raised a little money, once they're operational, how do they expand? How do they grow? How do they reach the public markets? Those are the people through that our outreach will be addressing. How would I word a letter to my congressman? What emphasis should I put in the letter? So actually, if you whoever wrote that, if you want to, Send an email to info at dreamx.com. I think I got that right. My team will tell me if I got it wrong. And maybe you can actually put it up in the chat. It's info at dreamx.com because we actually have some language from other people that have drafted letters and we'll give it to you. So I'll, we'll, we'll just send it to you by email. And we would love to make more connections with more people that are interested in what we're doing. Okay, good. So two things. Uh, one is... These are great questions. Thank you, guys. Um, first one is like, what's the time frame for passing the Main Street Growth Act? 
right now there's a very small window between now and the fall elections to actually get a vote on the House floor for the Main Street Growth Act. We have really from now until mid-October to get the bill out of the House. If that doesn't happen, it'll it'll start over in January, and I think it'll actually go faster. But once out of the House, the Senate has already put the bill in Jobs Act 4.0, which means that in the fall, a larger what they call legislative vehicle will be like the the appropriations bill. So every year the government has to pass a budget. That's what happened in 2018. They didn't pass a budget. They closed the government. When the government passes its budget, bills like the Main Street Growth Act that don't require any federal spending will be in what it likes, what, what is called like the financial services package. So the larger, what they call omnibus bill will be passed. And these types of pieces of legislation will be signed into law simultaneously with that. That has to happen by the end of the year. So we're going to find out exactly what course trading and wrangling all the congressional leadership is going to be doing over the next few months. We're working very hard on it right now. I don't know, Dwayne, I'm maybe misstating the number, but I think we've already in the last seven days, we've had seven meetings with congressional leadership in right. seven days. So and I think we have lined up until the end of the month a whole bunch more. So every day we're talking to the leaders of our government to make sure that they don't lose attention on the 11 page securities law and bringing it right into the forefront of their attention. That's the plan for that. The other question, this is a great question. I don't know who asked this, but how does the Dream Exchange plan to drive order flow through the exchanges? That is actually a wonderful question. National exchanges make their money when a buyer of stock and a seller of stock trade matches and that trade is executed. So every year we have about 3 trillion trade executions in our marketplace. The current environment, NASDAQ carries about 50% of that traffic. The New York Stock Exchange carries another 30% and then the other five exchanges carry the remainder. We will be the only minority exchange where uh, when a large financial institution pays a fee to a stock exchange for order flow, we'll, we'll be the only minority business that is qualified to do that. It's a very important part of their vendor management to do business with a minority exchange. So the fact is that the, they have a reason to come to our exchange to provide us with the secondary order flow from those financial institutions. And, and we are already talking to them. You can probably imagine a very big financial institution name. It, it might be the right one. <laughs> so the fact is doing business with us gives diversity credit to the vendor management that they have. We are technologically at this moment going to be the simplest and most technologically advanced stock exchange in the country when we open. We are the state of the art team, the team of people we've assembled and what they're doing in creating what we call the trade routing system, order matching system, and our order book will be the state of the art. We will be the gold standard in the industry when we open. So that removes all doubt. Because in addition to being a diverse company with diverse employees, with uh, minority ownership, we will also intend to be the best in class. So our order flow in terms of the simplicity of dealing with the exchange, the customer service of the exchange, the trade execution flawlessness of what we're creating will drive a lot of traffic to our business. We expect to see in the early stages market share growth, where we, we expect to see percentage point increases right from the beginning so that we're going to capture a, a fairly sizable amount of market share. Stock exchanges, there are, there are at least three stock exchanges that are solvent and profitable, and they have less than one of them has 
a quarter of 1% of the 3 trillion shares and they're doing fine. That's another part of our business plan, which is we're, we're very lean and mean. At, at our launch date, we expect to have fewer than 60 employees. And if you look at it, at the other exchanges, we're modeled in that environment after some of the newer exchanges. Uh, the barriers to entry are quite high. If you don't know what you're doing in creating a rule book and be, being compliant with regulation, NMS, SHO, SCI, there's an alphabet soup. If you don't know what you're doing there, you're not getting a license. And our team is trusted and we know who we're dealing with when it comes to market regulation at the SEC. So our confidence has never been higher, never. I'm just in love with where our business is poised because our success there will channel what Dwayne and I have been talking about, about the purposes of capital formation, especially in the underserved marketplaces. No stock exchange has ever dedicated itself to those purposes. So first, we are going to be state of the art and, and top of the industry as a electronic exchange carrying secondary trades. And then we're going to turn our attention to market development and bring on these small cap companies and really change the landscape, completely shifting how American capital finance in the public markets is done in America. I hope I see the full growth of this in my lifetime. This isn't something we started for five minutes. This is something that has a very good five-year plan and it has an even better 30 and 40 and 50-year plan where Dream Exchange will be another national treasure, just like the New York Stock Exchange brand is as well. So we've done everything we can to protect the integrity of what we're doing and to see the purposes through. I got another one. Um, and uh, actually someone's asking what's, what's SEC feedback. So right now on the national exchange, we were kind of below the radar on the national exchange licensing. So we haven't really pushed on getting any feedback where we're at. We know where we will be because we're familiar with the national exchange part of things. The policy making division of the SEC were very well known. One of the most interesting things that came up this past year was alternative ways to go public. Reverse mergers, pipes, SPACs, you know, direct public offerings. So we see all of those as viable ways to pe for people to approach the Dream Exchange. So one of the important research uh, elements that came up this year was are SPACs a viable way to go public? So we've done a tremendous amount. We hand gather our research. We do not take surveys. And we have hand gathered about 2000 SPAC transactions over the last 20 years. We're in the data analysis on that paper. Actually, we wrote the summary of the paper. So our director of research, Professor Floros, myself, and ironically, the, I think, I don't want to mistitle him, but he's the senior economist in charge of new market development at the SEC. Uh, his name is Vlad Ivanov. We're actually co-authoring the paper, which will become a gold standard on how SPACs have operated for the last 20 years. So on the policy making side, where the Department of Economics and policy for how stock exchanges should work, we're very, very well known. Our research is well known. And that is really what's driving our licensing because it, we're, we're not going into the marketplace approaching it like, oh, we just want to license and we want to make some money. We're actually, by way of policy, showing that the 1934 Securities Exchange Act had a purpose. And its purpose was to create secure, transparent capital markets so that the entire American investing public could build wealth. And we think the primary purpose of that law, which is approaching 80 something years old, is, is been somewhat degraded in that capital formation is not where people go to the public markets anymore. So we're reinserting the true policy behind the securities laws with our business plan and that has gotten tremendously good reception with right. policymakers at the SEC and in Congress. The mechanics, which uh, we also are quite uh, long in the tooth in our expertise, will follow. So we're in very good shape there. I hope I 
God, everybody, I keep getting more questions. Uh, and I th thank you. This is like a great way to to communicate and, and to get these questions answered. And I see I can see the chat over here, the ones that have been ignored, uh, like great information and thank you and well done. And Joe and Dwayne, you're my heroes. And I mean this sincerely. I think Dwayne and I both probably there were many, many other ways. He's a he's a Georgetown law graduate. There are so many other ways to to make money. We're in this for a purpose. This is a, the purpose of our lives, especially especially at our age. And and it, that's the pay I'm getting. I, I get the acknowledgement is so much more valuable to me than you know the money of this because there's other ways to make money. This is something our society needs. I believe this. Both Dwayne and I have children. He has grandchildren. I have the idea of grandchildren. <laughs> um, we, we really want this for the future generations right. to bring our country together. There's so few things in today's environment that we really all come together on it, it, as aligning with what's right. right. This is right. Prosperity in every community may be one of the key solutions to making all the civil unrest and problems that our society has magically go away. When people have a home and a good job, and we actually had Jory Luster's uh, company on uh, this during Black History Month, and he said it so eloquently. He said the thing he was most proud of was when he would walk through the parking lot and see all the cars that people had bought working for his company. And one of the most proud moments he would have is when he had to sign income verification so that people could get their mortgages on their homes. Well, what better thing is there than to, to work hard and then reap the fruits of your labor by being prosperous and having a home and a family and, and, and having a good and decent life in a free country? So we want that. That's an integral part of what we do every day. And I, I'm really grateful. We took a little more purpose time. I'm sorry I get on my soapbox at the end here, but we're going to we're restarting the webinar series. So you, you'll be hearing from us again. Actually, one other thing I might ask you is if you have a specific topic that you want to hear us speak to, um, we definitely are interested in hearing from you because our team sits down and we're we're trying to figure out what does everyone want to hear there's so much there's just a vast amount of information within our group that we can provide very detailed information like i haven't done a webinar on the mechanics of of exchanges in quite some time and i think that one might be coming is how does a stock exchange make money how does a company get listed on a venture exchange what are the mechanics what are the criteria how does all that work that might be one of our next webinars. And, and the other one that's coming is, you know, Dwayne and I have talked about this repeatedly about what's the true meaning of black participation in public markets? Is it board participation? Is it employment? Is it, uh, you know, is it a combination? Is it ownership? And what are all the very, we're actually researching that. I think we're probably going to have Dwayne, Dwayne and I will have a custom webinar on that's also being hand gathered. <laughs> so as we get more information on the research there, I think it'll be very compelling to hear that webinar, which is, is coming uh, soon as well. And now it's lots of thank yous and thumbs up. Great uh, Dwayne, plug, you, Joe. Great plug. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you have any parting remarks? I just want to thank everybody for staying with us. Uh, did I go over? We went over, uh, we went over by 15 minutes of uh, the hour, and I'm grateful everyone stayed. Uh, actually, almost everybody's still in the room. Do you have any any parting remarks other than thank you all very, very much? Um, no, that's it. I just, I just want to let um, people know that we re really sincerely appreciate their support. So please keep supporting us. I hope you're all prosperous, and we look forward to seeing you again very, very soon. Follow us, send your emails, and we will respond to you directly and straight away to, to help you with any of your with any of your questions. So. Everyone have a wonderful night. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you.